How are we all going? Good? Excellent. Rightio. Three questions this morning as we move into God's Word this morning. What are you going to learn today? I ask these every week and I think it's good that we can uh, re- set ourselves in a focus this morning. And what is God going to say to you and what are you going to do? So let's, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning that we can come into your house to worship you, to give you praise, to give you thanks. And Lord, just to uh, also not only to stand and lift our voices, but to sit and meditate and soak in your presence. Father, we thank you for the special time around communion this morning. Lord, that we, could re- we sit there and remember what you have done for us. But also, Father, be encouraged in, in what you are and who you are and how much you love us. Father, I thank you for your word, and as we move into it again this morning, as Annette's read to us from your word about um, the Apostle Paul and his conversion on the road to Damascus, Father, I pray that you will uh, help us to see something afresh today and be challenged today in our walk with you and in our uh, growing of our faith, Father. This I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So yeah, um, week three today, we are in the final message from our series called Wreck the Roof. The idea, as I've mentioned before, is founded from the Gospel of Luke, those that were with us in the first week, where we read of four friends bringing their paralyzed friend to Jesus to be healed. And if you remember from the story, they can't get into the house, there's donkeys everywhere out in the parking lot, they just couldn't get in there to where Jesus was teaching. So they had to find another way. And what did they do? They, they tore a hole in the roof, they, they ripped the roof, they wrecked the roof, and they lowered their friend down in front of Jesus. It was messy, absolutely, but it was worth it. His sins were forgiven and he got up and walked. And so this week we're going to talk about how do we embrace the mess? A tendency amongst a lot of churches, I believe, is to try to avoid the messiness of this world and avoid the messiness of other people. But what we've been called to do is to embrace the mess. Jesus came to you, he came to me, in the mess, in our mess. That's really the story of Christmas, I guess, as well. It's the story of incarnation, that God just doesn't tell of his love from his heavenly throne, but he comes down to this mess, to this world, and he shows us his love. He lived it, he demonstrated it, and we are called to love others that same way. So this morning I'm going to sort of not set the scene, I'm just going to tell you a story. We all like stories. And I read a story uh, a little while ago now, and um, I refreshed my memory the other day because it just related so well to the message today. And It was about a pastor who tells of a wedding that he officiated. And apparently it was, this wedding was absolutely epic. It was expensive, it was on a grand scale, there was an 18-piece orchestra, 24 bridesmaids, that's a lot, isn't there? And groomsmen made up the wedding party. This was a significant wedding. No detail had been left undone. Finally, the day came for the big wedding, and he describes the bride as, he says, ah, the bride. She'd been dressed for hours, if not days. No adrenaline was left in her body. Left alone with her father in the reception hall of the church while the march of the maidens, all 24 of them, went on and on and on. And here she was in the reception hall. She walked along the tables laden with gourmet goodies and anxiously sampled some food. First a little pink, yellow and green mints. Then she picked through the silver bowls of mixed nuts and ate, ate out the pecans, pecans, followed by a cheese ball or two, some black olives, a handful of glazed almonds, a little sausage with a frilly little toothpick on it and a couple of small prawns blanketed in that beautiful Thousand Island dressing. And to wash all this down, a glass of pink champagne, which her father gave to her to calm her nerves. But what you notice as the bride stood in the doorway, preparing to walk down the aisle as the the march of the maidens was, was happened there, was not her dress, but her face. It was completely pale, white, for what was coming down the aisle was a living grenade with the pin pulled out. He says, as she neared the front of the aisle, this is what the pastor said, the bride threw up. 
And by threw up, he writes, I don't mean a polite lady like Earp into a handkerchief. There's no nice way to say it. She puked. Two bridesmaids were hit as well as the groom, the ring bearer and me, says the pastor. And he explained that he couldn't do the ceremony in that space from then on. They had to move everything over to the reception hall and do the ceremony there because of the mess. He said, everyone still cried, mostly because of the sweet way the groom held his bride in his arms throughout the whole ceremony. And then he adds at the end of the story, and no groom ever kissed the bride more tenderly than he. <laughs> Quite a smile out of that one. But what a, what, a, what a wedding that would have been to be at. But when I read that story and reminded of that story, I love it because it reminds me of something. It reminds me of Jesus and the church. And you might say, what? How so, Miles? Well, because the church is described as the bride of Christ. But we are, we are a mess. We are a mess. And yet he loves us. And he is tender with us. And it would make sense for him to give us some space and some distance. But you know what? He draws us close. And the messier we find ourselves, the closer he seems to come. The more impossible the situation, the more present, I guess, we find him to be. This is the way that he has loved us. And this is how we as a church reflect his love to the world. That we don't run from messy people. We embrace the mess of our world. We don't remove ourselves from it and we have nothing to do with it. We're in the world, but you know what? We're, we're not of the world. And so the question from that is, so how do we live that out? How do we embrace the mess so that we can impact this world as a church? Now, the book of Acts gives us some ideas of the challenges and opportunities when it comes to the messiness of people. And as I mentioned in the newsletter this week, can I ask you to, this week to read Acts chapter 10 on your own, please? It's a really helpful picture, I believe, of the church embracing the mess, of bringing different people, bringing in different people. People, it would have been easy, I guess, to say, well, they're too different than we are. They're difficult because they grew up so much differently than we did. Their perspective and their practices is just so, so different. I'm just not sure it's going to work. Instead, when you read Acts 10, the church there, we see, brings them in. But today, I want us to look at Acts chapter 9 specifically today, as Annette read to us. And it's about the church reluctantly, I guess. I guess they you could say welcomes, but reluctantly accepts the Apostle Paul. So let's get started. So when we meet him in the book of Acts, he's not the Apostle Paul. His name is actually Saul. And he's introduced to us way back, I suppose a few chapters earlier in Acts chapter 7, when Stephen, a follower of Jesus and a leader in the early church, is being dragged outside the city by a mob to be stoned to death. And the people who are going to stone him to death, what do they do? Their jackets, I don't know, could be a little bit tight, who knows? Like they're throwing them, they can't get the velocity they need. So they take their jackets off and they hand them to a young man named Saul. And Saul is watching their coats. We read this in verse 58 of chapter 7. It says, The witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul, who would become known... As Paul. Well, why does Luke include this little detail? It seems like an odd thing to say. He doesn't tell us the names of the people throwing the stones. He just tells us the name of the person holding the coats so that the people throwing the stones, I guess, could be a bit more comfortable. It's Saul. He's introducing us to Saul because, you know what? Saul is going to be is going to end up leading the church in a significant way and writing much of the New Testament. Move a little bit further to chapter 8, verse 3. Saul has become the leader of this movement to wipe out the church. It says that he began to destroy the church going from house to house, it says. He dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. So do you get the picture? You get the picture here of Saul. The word that we might use to describe him today would be terrorist. 
Chapter 9 begins by saying that he, that he is, well, chapter 9 begins, here's the language, I'll put it up on the screen, breathing out murderous threats. He's in a rage here. He is angry. He is passionate to stop the gospel. He hears about it spreading and, he's, and it's getting close to a city called Damascus. And he decides that he's going to try to get there and put out the spark before, before it becomes a greater fire. So what's he do? He heads off to Damascus. It's about a six-day journey, fair way. He's got some people with him, going to terrorise this city, going to arrest, maybe even kill, I don't know, the followers of Jesus. And when he's almost at Damascus, he hears this voice. He's on the road and he hears this voice. And it's accompanied by this bright, blinding light. Literally blinded him. And the voice calls his name and says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And it's Jesus. And right there in that moment, Saul knows that he is wrong about everything in that moment. Let's read verse 7 together up on the screen. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sounds, but they didn't see anyone. And Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he couldn't see anything. He's blind. So they led him by hand into Damascus, and for three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. And so, this proud and predatory man is having to be held and led by the hand into the city he had come to terrorize. Imagine the humbling that he was experiencing right there and then. But here's where things get messy. Things get messy because the early church has to decide what to do with him. He had a reputation. He had caused a lot of pain, a lot of suffering to the people in the early church. And they're going to have to decide how they're going to deal with Saul. There's a tendency, I think, these days when we see somebody that makes us uncomfortable or we're aware of somebody who has hurt us or maybe someone we love to just say, well, I'm going to need some boundaries in that relationship. And can I say this? It's certainly healthy to place good boundaries in our lives. We could all learn a little bit more about that, I'm sure. And sometimes we need help establishing that. I agree on all those points. However, I think increasingly we tend to decide boundaries are needed whenever we don't want to do something that's uncomfortable. In other words, we know that reconciliation is the ministry that we should have through Jesus. But reconciliation, you know what? It's messy. So this is what we often say. and It's what we often say. I tell you what, let me just forgive you without having to reconcile to you because that makes me feel or makes us feel safe. We so often need to be reminded that Jesus came to not only to reconcile us to our Heavenly Father, but to reconcile us to one another. That ultimately, the gospel, needs to make a difference, not just in our relationship with our Father, but our relationship with one another also. And one of the most damaging testimonies of the church is when we can't get along with each other. Like we just can't accept one another. And when somebody hurts you, how do we respond? And I think our tendency is often to say, well, I forgive them. But when we see them coming, we walk to the other side of the street or then we find another church to attend. That sort of thing is called church hurt. It is real. And over the years, I've seen this being created and experienced by many. Church hurt happens when believers somehow become convinced that they're the ones who decide who's in and who's out. It happens when a church deals with someone's failure by cancelling them rather than restoring them. It happens when believers begin to, this is the scary one, to classify sins. And when they do that, we inevitably begin to think that whatever someone else is struggling with that's different to me, 
then theirs is the real serious thing, not mine. Something to think about. Let's get back to the passage. Paul is blind. He's probably scared. Can't see. He gets led into Damascus. And God is going to send one of the church leaders named Ananias to go to Saul to pray for him and to bring him into the church. Now just think about that. If that was your assignment as a follower of Jesus where God says, Hey, I've got somebody I want you to visit. Of course, God. Who do you have for me today? His name's Saul. Okay. There's lots of Sauls, right? No. Sorry, Ananias. Not sorry, but it is the Saul. Ananias had definitely heard stories of this Saul. And now God's saying to him, I want you to go to this person. So let's put up on the screen Acts 9, 13 to 14 and read this. Lord Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. Don't know about you, but I reckon Ananias may have said to God, Are you sure about this? Seems really, really messy here. Maybe we just do a congregational vote and we let the congregation decide, please. We, we just let the people vote on it. Maybe, maybe we just put this as an agenda item in the elder meeting and we see if there's consensus or, or around this idea of bringing Saul into the church. Maybe that would be a little bit more prudent. That's not how God works. And thank goodness that's not how God works. God says to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. This man, he says, is my chosen instrument. His chosen instrument. Broken, but just chosen. Broken, but the music that's going to come because of the brokenness, is going to be beautiful. There's a movie that came out in 2015. I don't know if any of you have heard of it or seen it. It's called The Landfill Harmonic, somewhat of a documentary, I guess. It's about a community in Paraguay living in poverty in a dump. A man comes to visit this community, and he's a music teacher. He just has a heart to make a difference. And so he starts this orchestra with these kids who live in the dump. And they find items in the dump to turn into instruments that can be played. And these kids who live in the dump play on these broken instruments and make beautiful music. Can I say this this morning? This is who we are. This is the messiness of the church God's chosen instruments. It can be messy, but it's beautiful. Now Saul, or Paul, is prayed for by Ananias. And I just want to just quickly stop there. Sometimes we get, you know, Saul, Paul. What is he? Paul, Saul. You know, yes, he was Saul. Then he became the apostle Paul. But his name, I just want to make this really quickly short, a little bit of history, a bit of info on this. Let's make this short and sweet. God didn't change the apostle's name from Saul to Paul when the man, this man became a Christian. That's a myth far too many Christians believe, and more, unfortunately, far too many pastors have taught. The truth is Saul and Paul were both the apostles' names well before his conversion to Christianity on the Damascus Road. Like Jews living in the Roman Empire, Paul had two names. His Hebrew name was Saul. His Roman name was Paul. Paul likely deferred to his Roman name because he primarily ministered to the Roman world, which would include both Gentiles and the Hellenistic Jews. That makes sense. He was just being a good missionary. If a Jewish name might be a potential hang-up for some of his audience, then he would probably merely refer to himself by his other name. It was simple as that, okay? Not sure if any of you knew that before, but now you do. Anyway, 
Saul is prayed for by prayed for by Ananias. His eyesight returns in verse 18. It says he's baptized. And we read in chapter 9, verse 20, it says he began preaching Jesus in the synagogue. Wow. And so what do we have there in chapter 19? We have the start of chapter 9. He's, he is breathing murderous threats. That's where it starts. And in the same chapter, we read he's preaching Jesus in the synagogues. This is the difference that Jesus makes. Wow. Wow. In verse 26, I know we didn't get there today in our, what Annette read to us, but verse 26, he then goes back to Jerusalem, which is the one place you wouldn't think God would send him back to, right? Like this is where he did so much damage. And it seems what would have made more sense is for God to say, okay, Paul, I'm going to use you in some dramatic ways, but this is over here in Jerusalem. You know, over there, it's just too messy. Too much damage has been done. We're going, to, we're going to the ends of the earth, the one place you should probably just avoid right now because it's a little too messy in Jer just Jerusalem. Stay out of Jerusalem. But that's where God sends him. Why? Because in this reconciliation, the gospel has an opportunity to become real. And there are people in Jerusalem who have been so wounded by, by this fellow. Paul was part of killing family members back in Jerusalem who were in there, in this church there. But God sends him back. And here's the thing this morning. If we can't get over somebody in the church who said something about us when they come and ask you for forgiveness and they want to come back and be part of things and, and we say, that's just too much for me. Well, you answer that question. You know the answer. Paul comes back to the church in Jerusalem where he was persecuting, killing, and having Christians arrested. Why would God want him to do that? Because that is the gospel. This is the difference the gospel should make. Look, if we're no different than the world, if our relationships are all broken and we don't have reconciliation with one another, then what are we doing? Like we should be so different to this. When Saul, Paul, came to Jerusalem, though it was messy, verse 26 says he tried to join the disciples. He tried to join the disciples. Tried. He tried. That phrase, tried to join. I want to be a part. But will they accept me after what I've done? He tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. You're going to have to prove, mate. You're going to have to prove yourself. You can't expect us just to forgive and move forward. I mean, you're going to go through some sort of process of earning it. And maybe if we think you've earned enough, maybe with time, though it will never be full acceptance, maybe we'll let you sit in the back. You'll have to come late and leave early. Then maybe, maybe we'll let you be a part of things. We need to stop right there. We need to look at something here. We need to look at verse 27. But Barnabas, one of the church leaders in Jerusalem, took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. Just one person here says, I got you. I got you, Saul. Made all the difference. Just one person that said, I'll stand with you. Just one person. And Barnabas does this for Paul. He speaks up on his behalf. And Barnabas probably took a hit for that. 
This was risking his own reputation. He was standing up for Paul, knowing that the church there in Jerusalem was going to have a hard time, was going to have a difficult time with it. And so for us this morning, as we try and embrace the mess that comes and goes and just is, here's the challenge as a church. I'll put them up, three takeaways today. Number one, like Ananias, we reach out to the people in their mess. We don't say as a church, well, tell you what, you get yourself cleaned up, you make restitution, you get things right, and we'll talk a little bit more. No, we reach out to people in their mess the way Jesus reached out to us in ours. Secondly, like Barnabas, we walk with people in their mess. We are willing to say, look, I know you've blown it. I know you've made some mistakes. I know you said you wouldn't, but you did. I know, I know you fell back into this, but I'll still walk with you. I'll still walk with you in it. Thirdly, like the early church, we remember that we are all a mess. Not just that you were a mess, but we are a mess. We are messy people. And yet this is what God has chosen. This is God's plan to show the power of the gospel through us. We are all messes and we come from a long line of mess makers. But Jesus loves taking messes and turning them into masterpieces. I just want to take you right back as I close to the four blokes up on that roof. What did they do with their friend to bring him into, in the front of Jesus? They made a mess. They weren't afraid of the mess and just cleaning up afterwards. I don't know whether they did or not, but they weren't afraid of the mess. They did what they had to do to get their friend in front of Jesus. We are all masterpieces. And I just want to leave with you a beautiful verse in Ephesians 2, verse 10, as we wrap up this series and wrap up today. And then I'll pray for us. And then we'll stand and sing a beautiful hymn, Firmly Stand for God. But Ephesians 2, verse 10 says, and not to forget this, remember, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. And some of those things that he's planned for us can be messy. How are we going to handle that? How are we going to do that? Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today. We thank you that you have cleaned up our mess and the messes that we still do make. We pray for revival, Father, and we wait eagerly for your return because it's what we long for. But right now, Lord, we know that what you're looking for within us as a church, as a community, is repentance, reconciliation, and a wreck-the-roof posture of heart. Father, I pray that we would repent of our sinfulness and that we would be reconciled to one another in all things, to be what you have called us to be, to make you known. We know that that can be messy at times. We know that it's hard. And so, God, I just pray that you would give us wisdom filled with the Holy Spirit and hands and feet that will move, that you would be honoured and glorified and that we would be united as one and that we would present the gospel of reconciliation that gives life in Jesus' name. We pray this together this morning. Amen.